So, for whatever reason, sometimes I do find myself telling real human people that I play competitive Pokémon. If I've successfully cultivated a certain trust and understanding with them over the course of years, and often what they will say to me is, that sounds fun, but you have to learn so much stuff. And brother, ain't that the truth. Are you telling me I have to remember every Pokémon? Do you know how many Pokémon there are? There's like a hundred. There's a new Pokémon every time I walk out the goddamn door. And yeah, okay, we all know Pinkums and Reptilicus, but what if I told you that you could comb through the sacred texts as much as you want, and you can learn which Pokémon look like this, and which ones look like this, but you still wouldn't know all of them. Because you see, there are even some Pokémon that you'll never see in a coloring book, or on a backpack, or a dialysis machine. Because these Pokémon exist on the fringe, just out of frame, and kind of blurry, but they're there. Do you see them? These are Pokémon Cryptids. Basically, Pokemon Cryptids are what I call any of the little goofballs who have only appeared in like one game or one episode of the anime, and then were immediately damned to obscurity. These are creatures known only to Arceus and not to science, but you may have actually seen a few of them before. Dexit actually started a couple decades ago. See, Pokemon Red and Green released in Japan in 1996 with 151 Pokemon, but not all of them made it to Gen 2. Because some of them fucking died. Yeah, Avril Lavigne wasn't the only superstar who died in the early 2000s and was replaced with a lookalike. Pikachu is definitely the most commonly cited example of this, because it's the big cheese, and Nintendo wouldn't let you go 30 minutes without looking at Pikachu even if you fucking wanted to. But Gen 1 actually has the original regional forms, some of which haven't been seen since 1998. Kanto's rampant pollution and microplastics have resulted in upside-down coughing and sideways cloister. And Kakuna used to have two arms before a horrible industrial accident. Not to mention all of the sprites that are just kind of ugly. Kid, you ain't making it in Hollywood. For better or worse, Pokémon's biggest selling point is its consistency. So these crappy sprites do offer an interesting window into a time before Pokémon was the highest grossing media property on Earth, asterisk, and was just a pair of 1996 role-playing video games developed by Game Freak and published by Nintendo for the Game Boy. And half the people who applied for the job of sprite artist were like, Oh, I thought you said sprite fartist. Eventually, though, the Pokémon company did find itself with an entire media empire that it had to keep consistent. And they had to start beating Korean animators to death if the Pikachu they drew didn't look exactly the same as the one on the Pokémon brand box of rat poison you keep on the bottom shelf. However, some inconsistencies did manage to slip through the cracks into later generations as well. I'm pretty sure they were still working on the Legendary Rascals up until like 30 minutes before Gold and Silver shipped, because like, these aren't even close. In Gold and Silver, once you get your Pineco to level 31, you think you're about to send out Fortress, but are instead greeted with... The Brain. And Arbok used to have a different spooky face for every region until the Spriders decided, okay, I have to draw like 500 Pokémon, I don't think I'm gonna redo the 374th best one. 
Gligar is the patron saint of making you think it's shiny because it was a completely different color like five games in a row. Shoutouts to Gold and Silver Spinarak as well. It was not just shiny. It's just abnormal. In Diamond and Pearl exclusively, you can find the elusive Pointy Gengar. And famously, Heart Gold and Soul Silver is the end of the line for Birth Defect Pichu. Oh, and I guess people would probably kick my ass if I didn't talk about Missing No, right? Missing No is probably the most famous Pokemon cryptid. There's not much left to be said about Missing No that hasn't already been said, but I guess I would just like to take this opportunity to announce to the world and let it be known that I adore Missing No, and that the world was more interesting when Missing No's mere existence automatically made every GameFAQs post kind of plausible. Maybe I really will unlock Yoshi in Pokemon Red if I beat the Elite Four 1,000 times and then eat an entire light bulb. Occasionally, the anime will have to make up new Pokemon cryptids for the purpose of visual storytelling. You've got slightly off-model dudes like the E-Boy Pikachu belonging to Ash's rival, and all of Mewtwo's clones from the first movie who have eczema so you can tell them apart from the real ones, because it's really important that you know the difference. A pretty famous example is Ash's Butterfreeze Enamorata, who it leaves Ash for in that one episode. I'll always remember you! Thank you for everything! Goodbye, Butterfree! Shiny Butterfree don't look like this, by the way. They made this one pink so you knew Ash's Butterfree was a heterosexual butterfly creature. Of course there's also the big bombastic examples like the handsome onyx and the really big dragonite for really big gamers. But there's also a Pokemon cryptid that appears in every episode because like Team Rocket Meowth is a fucking cryptid, right? Like this is not man or beast, but something different, something more evolved. As the saddest story I ever heard. And this is probably going to be the quote unquote best chance for me to talk about this, but uh, Jinx used to look like this, and it does not look like that anymore. This was passable in Gen 1 on monochrome colored Game Boy screens, but it did get its requisite one episode spotlight of the anime, and uh... Is there any chance Pokemon could still get cancelled for this? Wouldn't that just be like the fucking funniest thing in the world? Those are all arguably just a weird subspecies, or maybe they have a kidney infection or something, but occasionally the anime does tickle our balls a little with an entirely undocumented species. Pokemon Generations gives us the original rare puppers who all had to die horribly so they could become Raikou and Suicune and the rest. This artifact appears in a couple of episodes and perhaps might be based on a creature. Or the drastically less likely scenario that a single person in the Pokemon universe made a work of art that didn't involve Pokemon. This statue in Pokemon Origins implies the existence of some kind of little sweetie. And Ash's costume here implies the existence of something that looks like a cow. And apparently Kabutops used to have a 100-0 matchup against this thing that's basically just a big marlin. Which brings us to... Oh, some animal died. Hey, do you ever wonder how strong Raichu is? Well, it's at least strong enough to kill an Indian elephant, specifically. And the chef on the SSAN is certainly cooking up, cooking up, cooking up something good. The existence of regular style animals presents a lot of strange Darwinian implications that are probably best left avoided. 
but they are kind of a looming specter in the Pokemon universe. Particularly in early seasons of the anime where they either just forgot to not draw a real animal, or more likely just didn't have enough NPC-type Pokemon to really fill out wide shots. Real animals can also be seen in a few old TCG cards to establish some ambiance. Everyone knows Jungle Executor is the place to be if you're patrolling for detritus. And oh my god, look at Oddish's friend! According to Takeshi Shudo, the head writer of the original series of the anime, IRL animals actually went extinct in the Pokemon world a while ago, but fucking uh, apparently not. Unless you're trying to tell me this is a Pokemon. And it could have been some young child's best friend and companion, but odds were equally likely for it to be breakfast. Pokemon Pocket Monsters is probably the first supplementary piece of media in the Pokemon franchise. I'm not actually going to look up if that's true or not, but I do know that it's so old that they didn't even know Mr. Cheeks was the mascot yet. It's pretty obvious the artist was given no official artwork to reference and only had the Pokemon red and green sprites because this is the most off-model you'll ever see some of these Pokemon. And in just the best way, too. If you think you're psychic, maybe you are. But if it's the really juicy stuff you want, then look no further than this guy. <laughs> this guy is fascinating to me. Red catches it, they learn to laugh, they learn to love, and then it breaks free of the system and is never seen again. I'm gonna think about Pikachu every day for the rest of my natural life, but this guy stole my heart and then bailed like DB fucking Cooper. From now on, whenever anyone asks me what my favorite Pokemon is, I'm gonna say, oh, well, obviously it's this guy. The rumor come out, however, that this might just be an ugly diglet. Which, okay, sure. Whatever. But we got some critters here that don't look like no Pikachu I ever saw. And this ain't no damn Butterfree. Yo, Karibo? Or maybe his equally famous and successful brother, the wretched ghost of the attic? And this one's just a cock and balls. It's just a cock and balls. Hey, I'm changing my favorite Pokemon again. So in Red and Blue, there's an in-game trade on Cinnabar Island where you trade your Raichu for Doris. The fact that this NPC later says that your Raichu evolved confounded gamers for decades. Unless you were a big virgin who knew it was because in Japanese Pokemon Blue you trade a Kadabra for a Graveler. However, in current year, thanks to several developer interviews and also other less scrupulous methods, we now know that it's because this guy got Gorochu. The leak of Gen 1 and 2 beta assets is very interesting and could easily be its own video, but for now I would just like to point out that Raichu was almost even less popular. These handsome fellas took time off from filming Joe's apartment to appear in the development build of Pokemon Red and Green and were even special enough to put on Game Freak's website, but not special enough to actually make it into the game. Not as special as Seeking. For Japanese Pokemon Blue, Ken Sugimori updated the official artwork for every Pokemon. And this wasn't just limited to some more dynamic poses. Some of them actually had entire additions to their anatomy that apparently were not genetic because they were never implemented into an actual game, and then quietly reverted. Especially notable examples are Third Eye Open Cloister, Even Pointier Nidoking, and of course, Three Dot Venomoth. I'll be goddamned if I'm gonna make this video and not talk about Three Dot Venomoth. And there's even a Pokemon that actually made it into the game and still didn't make it into the game. 
If you played Pokemon X and Y and actually paid attention to the cutscenes in a Pokemon game for some reason, you might remember the weird Floette. It's got a weird flower, the big guy loves it, and maybe it does something of significance. I don't know. I don't really care. But it's actually programmed into the game with its own base stat total and even a signature move. And Game Freak was going to release the event for it, but they got tired. So in April of 1997, Ken Sugimori drew the cover for Volume 14 of the Micro Group Game Review magazine. And here it is. It's so weird seeing these in the Neuron Activation art style. It's like I'm looking into a parallel timeline. Maybe in this one Gen 2 was actually good. There's speculation as to whether these Pokemon were in development at this point, or if they were ever in development, or if somebody just saw this one and made the astute observation that it was the coolest fucking shit of all time. Ken Sugimori's interview in this magazine would indicate that he just kinda drew them. They would never do this today. When you're a hundred billion dollar property, you're a little more heavily curated than this, but in 1997, it wasn't quite like now, where it's like, oh, a new Pokemon game is coming out. It was still more like, Untitled Creature Game sequel is coming out. And some of the Pikachus, yeah, they'll probably look like this, I don't know. Who cares? Who gives a shit? Similarly, who's this elusive little cutie pie? Well, don't you know, that's Pikachu's friend. About 17 years before Pokemon Sun and Moon came out, you could find this tall drink of water on the Japanese Jungle TCG box. I remember seeing this at a game store when I was a kid and being, like, instantly captivated. And it made perfect sense to me. I didn't expect to ever find this in a game, or even find it in a pack, to be honest. Executor is a tree. Some trees are really big. Just like some people are really big losers. Pokemon Live was a musical stage show that is notable for featuring Mecha Mewtwo as its antagonist. It's also notable for not getting a home video release despite being produced at the height of Pokemania. Pokemon is an undeniable obsession with children across the country. Just how long will this fad last? But that's okay because Bulbapedia offers this very helpful plot summary slash manifesto. Oh my god, it just keeps going. Mecha Mewtwo would apparently, like, learn any move. If you used a move on it, it would learn it, but it, it would, like, learn it better. So it would always just be better than you. So to beat it, instead of you attacking it with a move, they, uh, love, they tell it they love it. What are you doing? You must do as I command! Not anymore. I didn't give you the power of speech. You didn't give me a lot of things, but you did give me the ability to learn. And I have. From the boy, I've learned about love and goodness. And it, learn it learns, like, what love is, and then it grabs Giovanni by the throat and fucking explodes. Oh my god! I would hesitate to call this a Pokemon, but I would absolutely not hesitate to call this my white whale. One day, I will wield the influence I need to own the 4,000 pound Mecha Mewtwo prop from the failed Pokemon musical. Or maybe they just threw it in the fucking trash. Oh, and you also got Zarud Dada. This isn't a real Pokemon. When you walk outside and you smell the Dada, 